Hey, good day, everyone. My name is Danny Weiss. I'm one of the I'm a neonatologist at Sunnybrook in Toronto and one of the co-chairs of the Neonatal Hemodynamics TNE Foundations curriculum, along with my co-chair, Dr. Danielle Rios, who you see is our uh, speaker today. Uh, a few housekeeping items. Uh, one, an, our acknowledgement and thanks to Malincrant, who has provided us with an unrestricted educational grant in support of the TNE curriculum. Uh, a reminder for everyone to uh, please use this QR code to complete the session evaluation. At the end of the talk, I'll be putting this back up. And one last uh, plug to register and save the date for the Dr. Reagan Giesinger Clinical Cardiopulmonary Physiology for the Care of the Sick Newborn course, which is coming up in just over two weeks. It's not to be missed. Uh, it's a, a fantastic course. Um, and it is, um, you know, offering state-of-the-art hemodynamic uh, teaching. Um, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to finally get to introduce my co-chair as a speaker uh, on in the TNE curriculum, Dr. Danielle Rios. Uh, she is an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Neonatology at the University of Iowa and interim director of the Neonatal Hemodynamics Clinical and Training Program, as well as co-chair of this uh, seminar series. Her areas of academic focus are the hemodynamics of critically ill neonates and predictive analytics to improve outcomes of extremely low birth weight infants. Um, she's gonna be speaking today on uh, pulmonary acute pulmonary hypertension, of course, one of the very core topics um, in uh, neonatal intensive care and in neonatal hemodynamics. And without further ado, it gives me great pleasure, Danielle, to hand the reins over to you. Uh, just one final reminder that uh, our trainees are welcome to keep their cameras off during the recording. Um, and obviously, we'll turn them back on after the talk. Um, Dr. Rios, over to you. Thanks so much, Danny. <clears throat> um, do you want to stop your share so I can start? See if I can get this going. Okay, does that look good? Good. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, um, it's been fun being one of the co chairs and the moderators for this series. So we'll see how this goes when I'm on the other side, right? Um, so I will be talking, as Danny said, about physiologic assessment of pulmonary hypertension using TN Echo. Um, so I usually like to start my talks with a like, where are we now type of slide, um, but I'm usually talking about hemodynamics in general. So the field of neonatology has come a long way in the last few decades, but we still in general practice a symptom-based approach. By this, I mean that we <clears throat> attribute symptoms to certain pathology pathologies and we'll give treatment um, based solely on those symptoms. So the issue with this is that if we don't investigate the etiology of those symptoms, we may be treating the wrong pathology. This is all due to what it says, a lack of precision. Um, for this talk, we are discussing acute pulmonary hypertension, so it's not really the same issue, but really the point of including my slide still is that um, to make sure that everybody knows we could see any of these symptoms, depending on where we are in the clinical course of acute pH, so we still need to be precise and look for the etiology. So the root of the problem uh, is maintaining adequate cellular metabolism. So to accomplish this, there has to be an adequate balance between oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. So both are affected by various potential issues. However, in the case of acute pH, we'll be dealing mostly with an oxygen delivery problem um, with oxygen saturation, preload, and afterload. So why is acute pH even a problem in our population? In previous studies. Um, have shown that pulmonary vascular resistance, or PVR, takes two weeks to normalize after birth, as shown on the image on the left. Additionally, on the right, you can see that PVR decreases rapidly, going from low PaO2 to a normal range PaO2, but there's less change after attempting to increase PaO2 past the physiologic range. 
This figure depicts the differences seen in adult versus neonatal hearts. So both the left and the right ventricle are more sensitive to increases in afterload, but the right ventricle is much more sensitive to augmentation and afterload and results in a, in a significant decrease in contractility. The um, other issue with our neonates is that we have an immature myocardium. So the top images, top two images, show the lack of T tubules in the neonatal cells, which explains some of the difficulties in calcium metabolism in the neonatal myocardium. Additionally, in the lower pane, so in B, we see a decreased amount of sodium calcium exchange and in C, calcium ATPase pumps in the neonatal cells. Additionally, neonatal myocardial cells are also known to be less compliant. So there's about 70% of non-contractile tissue and they're also less responsive to um, inotropes. So you'll often hear that neonates are unable to make change to stroke volume by affecting preload. So they must increase cardiac output by increasing heart rate. This is one of the reasons why physicians um, may have less concern about dopamine as the first line agent, knowing it will increase their heart rate. However, as shown in this image, neonates, so the newborns, are unable to increase contractility or force of their ventricular contraction by increasing their heart rate, whereas even an infant, I think this was three, three months old, um, is able to do so. So this delineates the importance of identifying the etiology and choosing the correct medication for treatment. In the case of acute pH, decreased preload will be a big contributing factor, so affecting pulmonary blood flow instead of heart rate um, would make more biological sense for treatment. Then I added in another um, kind of uh, discussion about force frequency relationship too. So along the same lines, uh, it's important to note, it, to note that the myocardium in general cannot maintain um, contractility in the presence of dysfunction. So the important part of this graph is right here in cardiac dysfunction, we do not have that same contractility. Um, so ultimately, the relationship goes out the window when you have cardiac dysfunction. So this is a figure um, that I'm sure you guys have seen many times. Um, it describes the many changes seen in the heart when acute pH is present, including to the right and to the left sides. Um, what is important for what I want you to see from this is that uh, the atrial communication shunting from right to left supports the pre-doctal cardiac output, while the right to left PDA supports the post-doctal cardiac output. Um, so if you have a right to left PDA, blood pressure measurements from that UAC, which is a post-doctal um, assessment, will overestimate the cerebral perfusion pressure. So now um, in picture format, what happens to your heart in acute pulmonary hypertension? So on the left, you start off with the normal sized left and right ventricle um, with a left to right PDA at the top and normal pulmonary, pulmonary artery pressures. In the middle picture, uh, your pulmonary artery, artery pressures increase resulting in some hypertrophy of the RV and a dilated RA. Um, and then in severe pulmonary hypertension, your RV progresses to dilation and failure. So this is kind of just the progression of disease process that we see. So um, taking a step back, when we're talking about neonatal pulmonary hypertension, uh, we are not actually being specific about one etiology. So it's um, the pulmonary pressures are increased but part of the assessment requires an investigation into why. So what is causing the pulmonary pressures to be increased? And the, pulmonary, the possible um, options include increased pulmonary blood flow, so over to the left. Increased pulmonary vascular resistance is what we actually usually think about um, and what we're used to dealing with, but that's not always the case. And then increased pulmonary capillary web pressure, wedge pressure, um, or a left heart phenotype. So um, as we get to the kind of TNECO portion of the talk, let's discuss some important considerations. So when assessing severity of pulmonary hypertension, direct measurements of the relationship between pulmonary and systemic pressures should have a greater influence on the overall assessment of relative pressure. So for example, 
When present in the setting of normal left ventricular function, the direction of the ductal shunt, the ductal flow, provides the clearest assessment of this relationship as compared to something like the septal positioning. Um, it remains important to understand that every measurement has its own limitations, um, and those need to be considered in a holistic approach. So examples of this include the finding that septal wall motion is evaluating relative pressure differences and will be underestimated in the presence of LV systolic hypertension or potentially overestimated in the presence of LV systolic hypotension. Additionally, something like the tricuspid regurgitant jet velocity is affected by signal quality and may be underestimated in the setting of RV dysfunction. So let's start with um, the interventricular septal wall motion. So normally, as is shown on the left, the crescentic RV <clears throat> wraps around the circular shaped LV with the septum in the in between the two um, in this the parasternal short axis. So as the right ventricular systolic pressure increases, flattening of the septum in the end systole may occur as is depicted on the right. Um, it's also important to note that qualitative assessment of septal uh, flattening may be inaccurate. So to help us with this, the measurement of LV eccentricity index is used in an, as an objective measure of septal configuration by dividing the horizontal diameter of the LV and end systole shown in the figure as D2 <clears throat> by the vertical diameter shown here as D1. In the usual round configuration on the left-sided figure, um, the eccentricity index is about 1. An eccentricity index of greater than or equal to 1.3 is indicative of an estimated RVSP of more than half systemic. So in the middle image, you can see that it's now a D-shaped LV in this case. So as the RV pressures continue to increase to suprasystemic, paradoxical bowing into the LV will be apparent and the eccentricity index will continue to increase and that's shown in on the right. It is important to note, however, that using an objective measure is not foolproof. So optimal visualiz visualization in the correct plane is required for accurate measurement. So the images here were taken in the same patient within seconds, literally seconds of each other. So on the left, um, we see A and C and the image is just not optimized. Um, but let's focus on C, where you see that the plane is not quite correct. So you have one papillary muscle, um, but you also are seeing um, the mitral valve leaflet. So this off-axis image leads us to measure an eccentricity index of 2.05. However, when you go and you fix your plane, when you fix um, your image, you can see that in D, um, with the correct um, the correct plane, uh, which has both uh, papillary muscles visible and no mitral valve leaflet, um, the eccentricity index is actually normal and the septum is in fact round. So next, let's discuss the estimation of right ventricular systolic pressure through measuring the tricuspid regurgitant jet velocity. So the tricuspid valve is evaluated in multiple imaging planes in order to obtain the cleanest jet with the minimal angle of insulation. The modified Bernoulli equation is used to estimate the RVSP as a surrogate for pulmonary artery systolic pressure. So on the left, we see a, col a color Doppler image um, in the parasternal, this is the parasternal long axis plane with an easily recognizable TR jet. So when that jet is doppered with continuous wave, we get the image on the right with a near complete envelope and the ability to measure the RVSP using the equation. So in the setting of an incomplete or unidentifiable envelope, the accurate pulmonary artery systolic pressure estimation is not possible. However, this does not rule out significant pH. Um, additionally, it'll be underestimated in the presence of RV dysfunction as well. So um, when we think about the blood moving from the RV into the main pulmonary artery, the resistance encountered may um, change the envelope of the normally laminar blood flow. So in the setting of normal pulmonary vascular resistance, the envelope will be in the shape of an isosceles triangle as is shown in um, A, I keep pointing, but I've got to use my mouse. 
Um, so it has gradual acceleration and gradual deceleration. So the time to peak, peak velocity of the Doppler envelope is the pulmonary artery acceleration time, the PAAT. Um, so in this situation, it's almost directly in the middle of the envelope. And so when PVR is elevated, the RV must pump against higher resistance, resulting in more rapid acceleration of the blood flow, leaving the RV. So this envelope will change uh, to resemble more of a right angle triangle. Who knew that we were going to be using geometry um, this far into our careers, right? So at this point, the peak velocity is much closer to the beginning of the envelope and the ratio will increase. Um, and that's shown here in B. So notching of the PA envelope um, in the deceleration phase may also occur, occur due to high PVR. Um, and that is depicted in C. Um, it's always abnormal. So even if we measure um, a normal RVET to PAAT ratio, um, if we see notching of the pulmonary envelope, um, we will label it as elevated PVR. I turned my phone off to not get that and it came in my watch. <laughs> Some things you just can't prevent. Okay, so we're gonna throw back for a second to remind ourselves of the changes of the heart with pulmonary hypertension. So the figure that I showed a little earlier where you go from a normal heart with normal size um, uh, ventricles um, and atria to the severe um, RV dysfunction um, over here with the dilated RA and the RV. And the reason is because now we get to see it in an actual patient. So um, as I said before, in the presence of the increased pressure, the RV may adapt by becoming hypertrophic and progressing to dilation um, as we were shown in that figure that I just showed you again. So in these images, we start off with the normal um, RV, normal size RV, which then begins to become more hypertrophy as it's undergoing homeometric adaptation. So on the right hand side, we see some hypertrophic, um, hypertroph hypertrophy and dilation on the top, um, and then progression to severe dilation um, on the bottom. And this is what we call the heterotrophic adaptation. So another important image that we use in the assessment of acute pulmonary hypertension is the RV3 chamber view. So when in the correct position, the aorta is seen in the middle of the image as a circular structure above the RV, and it shows both the inflow and the outflow tract with the tricuspid and pulmonary valves opening and closing. So this is um, the RV3 chamber view right here. So fractional area change or FAC of the right ventricle um, can be used as a surrogate measurement of RV ejection fraction. So you can measure it both in the apical four chamber view or in the three chamber view um, as we're doing here. So <clears throat> the reason that we use the RV three chamber more often is because we think that it's less influenced by interventricular septal motion than the four chamber view. And so in pulmonary hypertension where you can have issues with that, um, it's a better view to measure. So we measure in end systole, or, sorry, in end diastole on the top, First, and then end systole on the bottom, and then use this equation to figure out the FAC. Normal values are greater than or equal to 35%. Tricuspid in annulus, um, annular plane systolic excursion, or TAPSI, on the left describes the apex to base shortening of the RV, or in other words, the longitudinal motion of the RV, which represents the main component of RV systolic performance. So normal values are gonna vary, and that's based on gestational age, birth weight, and even postnatal age. So in the setting of RV dysfunction, the displacement will be minimal, and therefore the TAPSI absolute number will be low. So tissue Doppler imaging in the middle, or TDI, is used to measure the higher amplitude, lower velocity signals of the myocardial tissue motion as compared to the high frequency, low amplitude um, signals from red blood cells on conventional Doppler. <clears throat> um, um, so this also measures the longitudinal performance similar to TAPSI as well. So strain over on the right, strain and strain rate are measures of deformation that may help describe the nature and the function of the cardiac tissue. So strain is more helpful for evaluating global function, whereas the TAPSI and the TDI are more um, looking at regional abnormalities. So RVO, right ventricular output, 
uh, represents the amount of blood that's ejected from the RV into the main PA with the equation as shown. So we obtain this from either Paris or long or short axis, and we use the one that has the best angle of incination, um, and we want that perpendicular to the valve. Um, so the annulus will measure the hinge points of the pulmonary valve leaflets while open to obtain the pulmonary artery radius. The VTI is the velocity time integral from the Doppler tracing and the heart rate is obtained while measuring VTI to calculate um, the outputs. So with disease progression, we've already talked about, it's not uncommon to see RV dilation. So one method of following RV dilation longitudinally is measuring the RV and the LV area in end diastole um, and dividing the RV area by the LV area to get a ratio. Usually that ratio will be less than 0.5, definitely less than, point, um, less than one, but as the RV dilates, it will increase above one. And so if we had measured this image on the left, um, it would definitely be greater than one. <clears throat> so preload, um, left heart filling can be assessed with the pulmonary vein Doppler. So in the apical four chamber view, the right lower pulmonary vein is usually well aligned for obtaining a, dop obtaining a Doppler with minimal angle of incination. On the right hand side um, top image, we see a normal pulmonary vein Doppler pattern. In the presence of pulmonary hypertension, however, we might instead see low peak pulmonary vein velocity as a result of decreased pulmonary venous return due to decreased pulmonary blood flow. So this is what we're looking at um, in the lower image here, where we see our pulmonary vein flow velocity is rather low, as this and this is the same scale. This is just the decreased pulmonary blood flow. And then um, flow direction across the PDA provides the most direct method of evaluating the relationship between pulmonary artery pressure and systemic arterial pressure. The presence of an exclusive right to left shunt is always abnormal. And that's what we're looking at here in the images where you go kind of a sweep from the aorta over to the um, LPA and you see the, the completely right to left PDA right there. So uh, when the shunt's right to left for greater than or equal to 60% of the time, it indicates supersystemic pulmonary arterial um, systolic pressure. So it's important to note that a pre and a post ductal oxygen saturation gradient will only be present if there's exclusive or almost exclusive right to left sh transductal shunt. And therefore, absent gradient should not be translated to mean that pulmonary pressure is not pathologically elevated. You can also look at the PFO. So the presence of an exclusive right to left atrial level shunt or communication in the assessment of pH is always abnormal and that should prompt further evaluation. So here um, in the image on the left, we see an exclusively right to left uh, shunt through the PFO um, with color and then pulse wave Doppler on the right. So on the other hand, a left to right shunt in the presence of high pulmonary pressures um, could signify increased left atrial pressure pointing to pulmonary capillary wedge pressure as an etiology of your increased pulmonary pressures rather than increased PPR. So we all have heard of all of these medications, um, from, save maybe Riosaquat. I'm not sure if everybody's heard of Riosaquat. And these are the things that we talk about and use um, regularly in acute and chronic pulmonary hypertension. So in acute um, pulmonary hypertension, oftentimes we only use inhaled nitric oxide um, out of these. And then I want us to remember that there's also PGE down here towards the bottom, that is a medication that we can use in um, pH with the failing RV. Okay, so um, some of you will know what I'm talking about or what I'm getting at when I say MVP, um, but the first thing I wanted to do was remind you um, of our own Iowa MVP, who was Regan Giesinger. Um, who the conference is named after. Um, and so she was a fantastic physician and um, hemodynamic specialist. And so one of the challenges that she absolutely loved was getting these ECMO consults um, 
or referrals from outside institutions who would send a baby who they are like, this kid has to go on ECMO. We don't have ECMO. Um, you know, we're sending them to you to put on ECMO. And it was, you know, like her, one of her favorite things uh, to avoid ECMO by practicing good hemodynamics care. So her approach to stabilizing the pre-ECMO patient, which turned into MVP, um, was that she would get rid of the uh, wrong medications, essentially. So the ones that were not actually helping the physiology, she would use vasopressors, but most often vasopressin, sometimes norepinephrine, that um, would actually help with the pulmonary vascular bed and not harm it, not make it worse. Um, we, she'd keep the PDA open. She'd add in milrinone once she got the baby stabilized and the blood pressure is in an appropriate range. Um, and she would literally sit at the bedside and monitor all these changes with um, serial T and echo until she felt confident that we had avoided ECMO. She was very good at that. So let's discuss um, vasopressin briefly. Um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about these things because um, I do want to leave time for some questions. So uh, vasopress vasopressin in acute pulmonary hypertension, um, there is this study that showed an improvement in oxygenation index on the left with an increase in blood pressure uh, with vasopressin in infusion. Um, and talking about milrinone in acute pulmonary hypertension, so Studies have shown that it's also effective in reducing oxygenation index um, and FiO2 associated with better clinical um, uh, signs and symptoms like increased urine output and increased pH, and then also decrease in IMO requirement. Um, and, and there's multiple studies with both vasopressin and milrinone um, in different populations. Um, but for milrinone specifically in CDH, post-cardiac surgery, and acute pulmonary hypertension. Um, but there's also the population of HIE patients who are undergoing therapeutic hypothermia, who we know um, also have some sometimes intrinsic increased pulmonary vascular resistance that is then worsened once um, they are cooled. So in that case, um, there was a study that was done that showed that milrinone milrin was actually associated with hypotension. So milrinone treated babies um, that have HIE um, and are undergoing therapeutic hypothermia are shown in red. And so systolic arterial pressure on the top left, diastolic arterial pressure on the top right. Um, and you can see that those in the red um, are significantly decreased. Um, additionally, what they found was that they required an increased inotropic score. And so um, just a lot more vasoactives in order to help their blood pressure essentially because they became so hypotensive. So um, so MVP, milrinone for after low reduction, reduction in inotropy, but we have to have caution in renal injury, therapeutic hypothermia, if there's other drugs that we might be giving that could cause a problem. So thinking thoughtfully about medications before we start them and making sure that there's not some relative or absolute contraindication. Um, vasopressin for systemic hypotension, sometimes norepinephrine might actually also be appropriate, um, but in the realm of using vasopressin in our MVP, um, we have to be mindful of hyponatremia due to natriuresis. Some of these babies can pee out a lot of sodium, and so we have to be on top of um, monitoring and su supplementing as well. And then PGE for ductal patency. Um, this is really just for those babies that are, in, we're talking about acute pulmonary hypertension, so it should be neonates that are pretty early on in their course, um, and they should have a narrow or closed PDA. So the big question is why not dopamine? Um, a lot of neonatologists will say they feel most comfortable using dopamine because it's the most studied medication for blood pressure in neonatology, and I can't disagree with that statement. So. Let's look at a few uh, selected studies. So in this case, um, this is looking at vasopressors and pulmonary circulation, and this is a neonatal piglet model. So um, these piglets, I guess I'm going to say babies, but these piglets were made hypoxic um, and then, then given dopamine or epinephrine. Dopamine significantly, significantly increased the pulmonary pressure above the baseline expected for hypoxia throughout the dosage range. So um, even at the lower doses. 
whereas epinephrine at a higher infusion rate, so um, at 0.1 mics per kilo per minute, which is higher than we normally use in our patient population, um, did not it did increase, but did not increase pulmonary pressures to the same extent. Um, and you can see up on the top that it actually had um, a change in LVO, whereas you didn't see that in the dopamine treated babies, piglets. <laughs> so another study looking at dopamine plus high dose epinephrine or um, high dose dopamine. So in this study, the low dose dopa with the abbey and the high dose dopa increased blood pressure, but also increased pulmonary artery um, pressure, which is in the middle. So here's here's your mean arterial pressure, pulmonary pressure, and then the ratio of the two. Um, so it changed the ratio in an unsatisfactory um, way. So uh, the paper that I sent out to you guys to kind of go over um, this, you'll recognize this figure, um, both figures. So in pulmonary hypertension, dopamine kind of intensifies the negative effects of the increased pulmonary pressures by further augmenting those things. So, you know, the acute pulmonary hypertension causes a lot of this stuff, but then dopamine will then increase your pulmonary vascular Oh, sorry, pulmonary vasoconstriction more, increase your PBR more, which increases your afterload more. Um, and it could have worsening of the right to left shunt at the PFO to PDA. Um, the increase in heart rate might increase your myocardial oxygen demand, et cetera. So it just can add to a lot of things. So on the right, the figure on the right, in control lambs, so again, another animal study, um, the controls were in red. Um, there is a selective increase um, in um, systemic, so systemic versus pulmonary artery pressures, um, which increased the, the systemic to pulmonary artery pressure ratio, but there was not a change in oxygenation. However, when you look at the lambs who had acute pulmonary hypertension, so those are in blue, um, the baby, the lambs that had pulmonary hypertension, their pulmonary artery pressures here in the dashed blue were actually higher and much closer to their systemic pulmonary pressures to begin with at baseline. Um, and then when you added any amount of dopamine, those get significantly increased as well. Um, but here you see that the ratio uh, didn't actually change. So it increased both the systemic and the pulmonary artery pressures, same amount. Um, and then there was no significant um, change in the, um, the PAOT as well, the oxygenation. Okay, so to be fair, we have to talk about norepinephrine as well. Um, and so we talked about MVP being the vasopressin, but sometimes norepinephrine might be um, an alternative that you can use. However, it probably is also uh, a vasoconstrictor, a pulmonary vasoconstrictor, at least in certain situations. So here on the left, um, this study was looking at uh, patients in newborns um, in 100% oxygen versus those that are controls. Um, and you can see that in 100% oxygen, norepinephrine increased um, uh, the um, the construction of the pulmonaries more significantly. Here on the right, you have a study where they actually use milrinone to um, decrease both the pulmonary and systemic vascular resistance. Um, and so then you kind of have this significant drop here to after in the after melanone. Then you started either norepinephrine or terlopressin, which is the vasopressin analog. Um, and so the norepinephrine is here in the light gray, whereas the terlopressin is in the dark gray. And you can see that they both um, increased your SVR, which was something that is desired. Um, however, the norepinephrine actually increased your pulmonary vascular resistance, which is whereas the terlopressin did not increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. Okay, so now let's apply what we've discussed so far. So we have a 25 week premature infant who had PPROM since 17 weeks gestation, initially required 100% FiO2, was intubated, got surfactant, that improved things to 50% FiO2. Um, but then got significantly hypotensive. So systolic's in the 20s over diastolic's in the 10s and the teens. Um, 
and slowly the, the FiO2 kind of increased back up to 90%. So uh, hemodynamics consult was, um, was asked for and what they saw was moderate RV dysfunction. So here's your RV FAC and your TAPC. So your TAPC was low and your FAC was low as well. Um, and here on the left, you can see another sweep. So we do a, a ductal sweep from the aorta to the pulmonary artery and you can see the um, PDA briefly, all right to left. Um, and then on Doppler, you can see that it's all right to left as well. So now we have a controversy, right? So there's a Cochrane review out that says that um, ultimately INO should not be used for respiratory failure, hypoxia respiratory failure in preterm infants, um, that it doesn't appear to be effective. Um, and uh, some of the problems um, with this review is that it's looking at a bunch of different studies. So trials of babies in their first days with severe hypoxic respiratory failure, but also some that are at risk for chronic lung disease, and then also trials um, providing early, early kind of preventative therapy. So it's a mixed bag. However, looking really closely at the studies that they did include, um, we see that there actually was an improvement in oxygenation on in most, um, if not all, of the studies that evaluated this um, as an outcome. So there were several studies here, and then one that looked at pulmonary artery pressure. So we have to go back to my first slide of why would that be? So um, do we think or are we making sure that we're treating the right pathophysiology? So um, I will mention one study that our group did where we looked at premature infants um, who received inhaled nitric oxide for hypoxic respiratory failure um, and categorized them into responders, non-responders, and a new concept of negative responders, meaning the BB clinically worsened after INO initiation. Um, and in other studies, these are usually lumped in with the non-responders, which makes it seem like there's fewer responders. However, babies who were negative responders um, in the gray color here in the figures uh, were more likely to have PDA or sepsis physiology, not pulmonary hypertension. So that's not quite a shocker, right? Um, when we say that INO isn't working in preemies, um, it's possible that we're not treating pulmonary hypertension in these preemies. We're trying to use INO to treat some other pathophysiology that it's not meant to, to actually improve. Okay, so back to our baby. So two hours after birth, had super systemic pH, mildly elevated RV, moderate RV dysfunction, mild LV systolic dysfunction, and a large PDA with right to left shunt. So we went against the Cochrane review and we treated with nitric. Um, we also added some dobutamine for the dysfunction, and then there was some vasopressin added um, as well. Um, and the baby's FiO2 improved to 40 to 45% and then continued to kind of slowly improve from there. So we got an echo again less than 12 hours later, and this is what we actually saw. So you can see um, the septum, and again, qualitative measurements or, or assessment is, is not reliable, but it looks rounder. Um, but here you can see the arch, the P LPA, and the duct. And now, I mean, it's you can't miss that duct because it's mostly red. You can see that it's um, a little bit bidirectional, so it's mostly left to right at this point. Um, so the other question is, when you do have a bidirectional or right to left PDA, is it always pulmonary hypertension? So um, this goes back to kind of some, something that we talked about early on. So you have a small baby, a 23 weeker, who's on um, the jet ventilator with the map of his team, but requiring 100% FiO2. Blood pressure is 50 over 35. Here's your pulmonary vein flow, and you can see um, that it's pretty low. Your EF is okay, but your TAPSI is, is not. It's pretty low. Your LVO is low, your RVO is low. Um, your RVT, RVET to PAT is um, elevated, and then your um, eccentricity index is elevated as well. So just take a second. Do we think this baby has increased pulmonary vascular resistance or not? And so 
green means go. You have super systemic pulmonary hypertension, decreased RV systolic performance and low cardiac output with the high PVRI and flat septum. So baby needs some pulmonary vasodilation and iatrophy. This 25 weeker um, had PROM at eight weeks. FiO2 is 40% and BP was 25 over 11. So now when we look at pulmonary vein flow, we see that it's, it's there. Um, it's not low. Your EF is 70, your TAP C is 5.7, which is in the okay range. Your LVO is um, 238, RVO 216, RV to the PAT um, is in the normal range, and your septum is round. So, with, so no. So normal biventricular systolic function with normal cardiac output, no pH, normal PDR, and a bidirectional PDA that's actually due to um, severely low SVR. So um, this kiddo needed treatment with vasopressorin and volume. So now you have a term infant with um, HIE who has is undergoing therapeutic hypothermia, has signs of um, low cardiac output state, uh, pre-ductal SATs 91, post-ductal 55, it's requiring 100% of IO2 and has cardiomegaly on x-ray. So you take a look at this, does this look like one of our acute pulmonary hypertension um, figures when we go back to the adaptation? So I'm gonna say yes, but then you look at this next image, um, and that does not look normal. So this is supposed to be looking at the arch and you can tell that there's an issue there. Um, so congenital heart disease and specifically left-sided uh, structural issues um, will increase your pulmonary capillary web pressure, web pressure, wedge pressure, <laughs> excuse me, um, which will look at look like pulmonary hypertension or is pulmonary hypertension it will increase your pulmonary pressures however it's not due to increased pvr and it's not treated with pulmonary vasodilators so we actually can make things worse if we start with pulmonary vas pulmonary vasodilators in this situation and then another one who um has um was a term infant, acute hypoxemia, cardiomegaly on x-ray, again, signs of low cardiac output state. Um, and just look at the images and see if you think that anything is abnormal in these images and what you'd be con concerned about. Um, and let me tell you that the flow is high, the RV is not great. Um, and of course the PDA again is bi-directional, 70% left to right. So at 60%, if you remember, we said that's super systemic pulmonary hypertension. So you have super systemic pulmonary hypertension in this patient with um, low RV function. Um, and this is your SVC, so a dilated SVC. So um, what would this baby, what would you do? I know we're not asking questions because it's being recorded, but um, but in this baby, we would look for a reason why um, there is actually retrograde flow here in the aorta. So I'm not sure if anybody else noticed that, um, but usually you have nice laminar blue flow. This one, you have red flow kind of going back up towards the brain where there's a vein of Galen malformation. So this still looks like pulmonary hypertension. And if you get a cardiology echo, oftentimes they will tell you, you have pulmonary hypertension because your, your PDA is more than 60% um, right to left. However, again, um, if you started pulmonary vasodilators, that is not actually the, the correct um, therapy for something like a vein of Galen or usually a flow-driven pulmonary hypertension because it could actually worsen the underlying physiology. So um, the paper that I sent out also had um, this little algorithm that I think is the starting point for everybody to um, kind of use. So if you have what you consider to be um, acute pulmonary hypertension, um, the first thing that you should do is try to confirm that diagnosis um, and confirm that, um, that it's not actually LV, 
LV dysfunction or increased pulmonary capillary web pressure, wedge pressure, or increased um, pulmonary blood flow that's causing the increased um, pulmonary pressures. And then go down, do you have RV dysfunction? Yes or no. Do you have hypotension? Yes or no. And kind of go based on um, the clinical scenario and what you're finding on your, um, on your echo as well. Okay, so in conclusion, ECHO is an essential tool in diagnosis, stratification, and longitudinal care of patients with pulmonary hypertension. It's essential um, that high quality imaging is obtained in order to ma maximize the accuracy of the information um, that you get from the physiology. And then comprehensive imaging um, with quantitative rather than qualitative qualitative evaluation is important to ensure phenotypic precision and to select the appropriate management strategy. And so um, I'm part of a great hemodynamics program here at Iowa where we have five faculty um, and we do greater than like 1500 consults per year and actually have a fellowship program as well. Um, and we've recently renamed it after Dr. Giesinger who um, passed away earlier this year. And happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Daniel, for that fantastic talk. And you went through some very interesting cases in just a couple of slides. I have a feeling there are going to be some questions. <laughs> to, uh, to kind of That's only talk for 40 minutes, right? <laughs> That's right. 